Good morning. Um, I'm about to cover a fair bit of material in a very short time, so if you don't follow, if you miss something, please feel free to interrupt me at any time, okay? Yeah? To start with, I'd like to make some acknowledgements. I'd like to thank Pete and Co. for the permission to disclose the information I'm about to unfold, as well as Cubic Solution for the provision and the installation of the StormTech um, drains. All right. There has been some previous work done on this topic. In fact, Alex Rogers from JDA has given a talk in the Hydropolis 2010, and he used the Kryzhenhov equation to basically mimic the observed data of the uh, groundwater mounding between the subsoil drains. So basically, the data I'm working on, the data set, is the same. I'm changing the methodology. The uh, Kryzhenhov equation is a 1D uh, solution which returns the volumetric flow rate to the soil and it doesn't work with layers. So in my model I have included the sand as well as the Guildford formation clay. And ModFlow um, includes, has a built-in package for evaporation as a function of depth, which I will discuss in a few minutes. And, and then it analyzes the soil in layers. So let's keep on. Okay, the trial site is located in the city of Armadale, uh, 30 kilometer away from Perth. From, um, okay. uh, from the map, you can have a look at the isopotential lines for the groundwater contours uh, for the South River uh, District Water Management Strategy. The site is here and the contour returns a value of 25 meters Australian high datum. Um, the green dots are the, uh, pri the private bores, whereas the yellow dot is the DOW bore, which um, played a key role in the validation of the theory of a perch water table, and I'm about to explain that in a second. Okay, this is the subsoil test site. The, um, the wall area, the pale yellow pole um, area has been sand filled. However, for the sake of this investigation, we will be focusing on the area delimited by the two subsoil drains. As you can have a look in here, the subsoil drains are 80 meters apart and they are aligned uh, from south to north and um, discharging to the Park Avenue drain. Um, as part of our investigation, we conducted some lab uh, hydraulic conductivity tests on the sand, which returned a value ranging between 5 and 2 meters per day as hydraulic conductivity. So we have a parameter, we have a reference, so the value I will be calibrating the model on shouldn't be much more far away than 50% of these values. This is the monitoring la 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 layout. Um, the green dots are shallow bores and has been installed in this um, fashion specifically to intercept the cross-section of the drains. Um, the green dots um, are uh, monitoring manually on a monthly basis, whereas um, the center bore in the center line of between the drains has a data logger in it with a time step of one day, so we have the water level high datum per day, and together with a deeper bore in here, which intercept the regional groundwater table, and it will be important because I'm about to show you why. Here we are. So the regional groundwater table is marked with the uh, black the, the dashed line. It goes from 22 meters AHD to 21, so this is the gradient is flowing northwest. Whereas the reading from our board shows a maximum mounding level of 26.5. Now, it is very easy to notice here that uh, the ground, the regional groundwater table is several meters below the recorded uh, water level in the trial set, and this proves that there is indeed a perched water table there. This is a schematics. Um, um, the primary um, uh, principle by which a subsoil drain function is basically the provision of an outlet 
to a sorted pipe system such that the groundwater can flow driven by the gravity and governed by the Darcy's law toward the pipe, thus lowering the water table. Here we have the shallow <coughs> bore with the data logger in it, and here is the control. So here is you have your reading of 22.1, and here is the natural surface is two is 26, which has been sand filled 1.5 meter above. So when rain uh, occurs on the top, it can easily percolate, and because um, clay hydraulic conductivity is extremely small, um, these layer basically act as an aquitard. So we will have um, an unsaturated zone on the top, a saturated perch water table, and beneath the aquitard we have again unsaturation and the saturation with the regional water table. Again, I'm referring to the center line and it's important because we estimate that the if the maximum mounding occurs, it will occur in here. Okay, this is the observed data from the logger. Um, uh, my mod flow model starts in March and ends in October because we are interested in the mounding dynamics in the wet period because in summertime the perch water table will virtually vanish because there is no recharge, it will all drain to the drain. And according to the data we have a maximum mounding occurring somewhere in July 2010 of 26.65, so a mounding of 16 65 centimeter and again this is the bore in the center line so all the other values here are lower than this one of course okay here is you have the cross section so uh, east to west and by plotting the water level height we can um, interpolate the water level height between the bores so we have a high mound in the winter and a very low value in, um, at the end of the wet season. So virtually at the end of the summer, say February, there will be no perch water table at all. Again, we are here. <laughs> okay, um, the model has some assumption, of course. The model has the assumption that the top surface is completely flat. We know that it's not like that because it varies of, of half a meter throughout the side but we just approximate as a flat surface. We used a recharge rate of 80%, so 80% of the rainfall that fall on the top goes in the, um, in the water table. We use this high value because it's virtually bare soil, there is no interception at all, there are no plants, so no evapotranspiration, and no water interception from plants or houses. Now, Hydrograph on the bottom, you can see there is, um, everybody will recall the event of the 22 of March 2010, so there is a strong correlation in here. And we have calibrated the data, the black line is the logger and the green line is my model. We have calibrated with a parameter of recharge 80% with a hydraulic conductivity of 12 meters per day, which is accepted in the range uh, given for um, fine core sand and a specific yield of 16%. What is important to note here is not only the matching of the peak because this rainfall data has been sourced from the nearest rain gauging station at the Bureau of Meteorology that is somewhere five kilometers away from the site. So basically we didn't match this peak because probably at the site um, experienced more rainfall than the recorded one. So this makes sense. But what is most important is the slope of the recession <coughs> period. So if we match this slope, it means that the model is mirroring the hydraulic conductivity and the hydrological um, parameters of the soil, and it's very important. And again, according to the model, we have a maximum mounding of 75 centimeter, which is slightly higher, but it's only 10 centimeter of difference. So, And here you have the top soil on the top. Okay. There are two ways to estimate the accuracy of true data population. I like to call one is quantitative. You have a mathematical formula, the mean uh, root square. So we have true population of data. 
and the function return a value that range between 0 and 1. If the value is close to 1, there is a strong relationship between the two sets. So 0.94, my model mirrored uh, the observed data with 94% of, accu of accuracy, and I think is a pretty good result. As I previously mentioned, um, there is uh, an evaporation package in Modflow that works with EPAN evaporation on the top and then estimate the evaporation as a function of depth with an extinction depth of 1.5 meter, which is the depth of the centipede. You can have a look that the difference is virtually negligible. But it's good to have a look at this plot because it's a validation of the model because in winter, the evaporation is much less than in summer. So if you, you can have a look at the gap here, it's much smaller than here. So it's a proving that the model works and makes sense. But because it's such a small difference, we decided to disregard evaporation. So this model here is without evaporation, okay? Because it makes such a little such a little difference. This is the qualitative way on how to estimate the acceptance measure, I'd say. If, the theoretically, if my model was perfect and um, we plot the, da the data logger versus the model, we should have a straight line, isn't it? Now, there is no such thing as perfection when it comes to modeling, but I'd agree that here is a previous linear trend except for this point, which is the erratic event of March 2010. Probably the rain gauging station recorded more than what actually occurred on the site. So. <coughs> Another very good nice thing about Modflow, it returned the, re the result of the water level height as a function of x, y, and z, so you know exactly where it is in space. And so we have a maximum mounding here of 74 centimeter above the um, clay and sand interface. And you can have a look at the isopotential line in here as it decreases. So it's a 3D model. Now, because the topsoil is, is virtually bare, we calibrated the model as a pre-development scenario. So I said, no, okay, now we have these two value right. Let's model it for a post for a post-development, how do we do that? We decrease the recharge rate to 40% because we assume there if um, you have a house or building or lots, you have a lot of interception, plants evapotranspirate, so we thought it was reasonable to use 40%. And instead of using the mean average annual for Perth, I went to the worst case scenario. So I went to the bureau and I picked the wettest year since the um, rainfall daily data was available. 2008 was the wettest year with 40% recharge, same parameter as the calibrated one. The maximum mounting occurred in um, somewhere 12 July 2008, 52 centimeter above the interface. So here you can appreciate the fact that the maximum fill of 27.5 is a bit too much. It can be less and it will be safe as well, as, as safe. And again, um, the 3D plot for the maximum mounting for uh, the post-development scenario here. Okay, takeaway messages. Um, this is the first set of data for um, groundwater mounding between subsoil drains in Australia. And there is no disguise in the fact that perch water table does develop in sand fill area above natural clay surfaces. And mounding develops um, progressively over the winter, and then it will have a recession time when the rains stop and it will vanish over the summertime. The maximum mounding is obviously dependent upon several factors such as soil, hydraulic properties, rainfall. So is the local weather and environmental condition, I'd say. Modflow is indeed an appropriate tool for modeling and estimating the mounting height. And when appropriately designed, I believe that subsoil drains can be an effective vector to obtain a controlled groundwater level. And evaporation from shallow water table is negligible, makes very little difference if it's pre-development. 
And the minimum sand fill requirement should be flexible and of course based upon local weather and environmental condition rather than a fixed number or a fixed value 1.5, just regardless. Yeah, that's pretty much all.